Welcome to another Zoom with Herman Bailey sitting right here in my office. I've been in this office for 40 years. It's not a, it's not a scene behind me. You know, you can get those things now with beautiful scenes behind you. This is the real thing right here. And the real thing today, one of my favorite guys. I have, I probably shouldn't say this because everybody's going to be asking me, but I have about that many that I can cover on my hand, the, the top, the top, all of these years that I've had interviews, this is one that I just look forward to. And so does the audience out here that watches on a regular basis. Uh, I'm just, I'm just saying to my guests that my audience would prefer that we have this guy that you're about to meet at least 50% of my programming. So, so it, it, is, it is that uh, amazing that he has such a following and is such a brilliant guy. I want to introduce to you my friend, William Federer. Good to have you once again. He's well, more, Her you're, you're, what's that? Oh, Herman, it's great to be with you and, and blessings to you and Sharon. Yes, and, and you're in Oklahoma right now, right? Right. Yes. Yeah, speaking at a number of different places. Uh, there's a Randall University and then some churches and uh, but just trying to help bring our country back to the Lord and excited about a new book that uh, we just came out with. We're going to be talking about it. You're a nationally known speaker, president of Amero Research Inc. You have a daily radio program, right? Yes. Called American Men. And, and a TV program? Called Faith in History. Yes. And, and how many books have you written? It's about 25. Absolutely. I, I, have to, I shouldn't have favorites, but I have all of your books right here in my library. And I don't give them away. There's a lot of books I give away. I just hang on to yours. But oh, this, is, this is one of my favorite. It's, it's got to be one of your best. And in fact, it's kind of funny. I was in a used bookstore uh, some time ago, and I'm looking because I love to go and use bookstores, and and they had one of these on the shelf, and I and I bought it, and I thought I I have about four of these, but I bought that one. It was a it was not a hardback, and I thought I can't let this go, a, even even in the used bookstores I bought it. But but your books are absolutely they're treasures to me and to many people that have them across the country. But and I, and I have to tell you this one got a lot of comment. This is absolutely going on socialism as if you had written for today. I mean, it is so appropriate. If you follow this book and what is happening in America, because it used to be you would follow a book like this and say, oh, that's happening in China, that's happening in, in other countries or whatever, but America, no. America is absolutely are we past being turned around? Are we to the point where you use the term it's doomsday? Um, it, it certainly looks like we're moving in that direction. Uh, I, I always have hope and the stories in the Bible is God waits till things look hopeless and then he raises up little nobodies with faith and courage to turn things around. Uh, but the book, for those that are not familiar, is called Socialism, The Real History from Plato to the Present. And the subtitle is How the Deep State Capitalizes on Crises to Consolidate Control. So socialism is a structure for society with a ruling class and the ruled class. Yes. Look back to Plato, Sir Thomas More's Utopia and all these different experiments. And it's the ultimate bait and switch. It promises one thing, delivers another. It's a dream that turns into a nightmare. And uh, I tell if older fish could tell younger fish to stay away from shiny things dangling in the water, like fishing hooks, but they can't. So every new generation of younger fish gets caught, right? And so socialism is a shiny thing dangling in the water. Free food, free education, free welfare, free, free, free. Free is attractive. The only problem is once they bite, there's a hook. And there's a quote from Gerald Ford, where he says the government that's big enough to give you everything you want is big enough to take away everything you have. Amen. Yeah, you know th this again is <laughs> is an amazing book. It is. 
a kind of material that I'm telling you it should be taught in our public school systems and so forth, but they're taking all of our history away. Am I right? Right. So this is a book. It's called uh, Miraculous Milestones in Science Medicine. You're going to have to turn it upside down. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, so it's, um, for those that are not familiar, they're doing cancel culture on campus. And if a professor mentions that he believes in a creator, that professor is fired. He could lose his job if he believes in intelligent design. And, and if a student believes in a creator and mentions it in their paper, that they could get flunked. They could, And so we're seeing an anti-biblical uh, movement on campus. And so what this book is, Miraculous Milestones, it's collections of famous scientists and their statements of faith. So Copernicus that discovered that the earth uh, is not the center of the uh, solar system, the sun is. Uh, and so Copernicus believed in God. Uh, Kepler, who discovered the laws of planetary motion said, oh, almighty God, I'm thinking thy thoughts after thee. Wow. Uh, Sir Francis Bacon, who helped start the scientific revolution, he said, a little philosophy inclineth men's minds to atheism, but much philosophy returns their minds to religion. Um, and then one of the interesting chapters I have is on the history of hospitals. So uh, there was no medical care for the poor in ancient Egypt uh, or in ancient China or in Greece. Medical care was just for the rich people that could afford it or the royalty. Yes. Jesus said, whatever you do to the least of these, my brethren, you've done unto me. Jesus said, I was sick and you visited me in that parable. Jesus gave the, the story of the guy, uh, of the good Samaritan, finds somebody beat up on the road, brings him to an inn, pours in oil and wine, and then gives him money. And so the early Christians began to follow Jesus' example and take care of the poor. And then you had pilgrimages and people would travel to the Holy Land and uh, to go to the holy places, but they would arrive worn out. And so they decided that every church where people are making a pilgrimage to, it should also have an infirmary to take care of the travelers. Wow. And so the word for traveler in Latin is hosp, H-O-S-P. That's where you get the word hospitality and hospital. And so then uh, in the third uh, uh, century, uh, the Consul of Nicaea had a infirmary in every cathedral and uh, then they had the fifth century and uh, a plague of Justinian, and it kills millions of people. And there is St. Samson the Hospitable in Constantinople, and he takes care of the poor and sick, brings them into his house, does such a good job. The emperor Justinian um, uh, gets sick and calls him and the emperor gets well and gives him a bunch of money. He starts a hospital in Constantinople, another plague in Rome, and then the Christians are giving money. And then the Benedictine order starts the hospital in Paris, a hotel to you, and the first medical school in the ninth century started by, by monks in, in Salerno, Italy. And then you have the, the bubonic plague. It comes from fleas on caravans from China. I can imagine a plague coming from China. And um, the uh, uh, plague kills 75 million. They have million. people coming across the border? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they had the, the China Silk Road and the Across the Gobi Desert, and then they would land in the Middle East and then get on ships and come to Constantinople. And uh, the rats would have fleas on them and they would carry this. And so, this bubonic plague in the 1300s kills uh, like a, a quarter of Europe, 75 million people, and nobody wants to bury the dead. And so, you have the Election Brothers, an order of Catholic men that collect the dead bodies and give them a Christian burial. And if they're not dead yet, well, then they have a hospice ministry to them. And then every now and then one recovers. And then the person's so happy, he donates money back to them. And, and then you have the uh, St. Vincent de Paul in the 1600s, about the same time the pilgrims are coming to America. He's captured by Muslims. He's made a slave for several years. He witnesses to his master who ends up getting saved and allows him to escape. <laughs> Vincent de Paul comes back to Europe and he starts a hospital. Oh, and and then you have a bunch of these uh, sisters called the Sisters of Charity of St. Vincent de Paul, and they start hundreds of hospitals all across Europe. Uh, and so then the French Revolution takes place, and they chop the heads off of these nuns. And there are stories of... Why? Why? Because they wouldn't embrace the new secular health care program. 
uh, sort of like the, the little sisters of the poor being- I can uh, see the future the, coming for America. Yeah, I mean, here Obamacare is forcing these little sisters to pay for abortion. And they've taken vows of chastity. Why are they even having to pay? And so they've had to argue all the way to the Supreme Court. Yes. And so we have the government forcing them. And so the irony is the government's wanting to force people to give up their Christian values. Yet it's their Christian values that invented hospitals. And these nuns in Paris were singing their church song. One by one, they were being led to the guillotine. And there'd be one less person singing, one less person singing until finally the last person gets their head. Nobody's singing anymore. And um, But then Ben Franklin helped start the first hospital in America. But then these Catholic nuns come over and they start hospitals. So the Sisters of St. Joseph start the first hospital west of the Mississippi. And, uh, and then during the Civil War, there were whole orders of nuns following the, the army around, sort of like Clara Barton taking care of the sick. And one of the generals said um, that uh, these Sisters of Charity are, are the best nurses on the battlefield. And then you have the, the Crimean War over in Europe, and there's Florence Nightingale, and she's the lady with the lamp taking care of the sick soldiers. And she said, there's no better training for nursing than that of a Catholic nun. And so the nuns habit called their, their hat that they were wearing. Yes. That became the nurse's hat. Remember how nurses used to wear the little hat on their head? That yes. came from the nun's hat. And so uh, about eight of the 10 largest hospital corporations in America started out of the Catholic church. And then others were started by Presbyterians and Methodists and Baptists and Seventh-day Adventists and Lutherans and so forth. But it was Christians pioneering it. Uh, and then in the uh, you know 18th hundreds, you had a, a, the Jewish movement to start Jewish hospitals, um, but it wasn't Islamic hospitals. It wasn't Chinese Buddhist hospitals. It wasn't uh, even uh, Henri, Henri Dunant that started the International Red Cross. Uh, he's the one that decided to uh, go into Turkey, but they were offended by the cross. So he, for Turkey, he changed it into the Red Crescent instead of the Red Cross. And so even the the the, uh, the Turkish ambulances and you know their Red Crescent comes back to a Christian man Henry Dunant who had a, a YMCA chapter in in Switzerland and but you see the Christian roots of healthcare and how ironic it is today that you have a government wanting healthcare providers to throw out their Christian values and say, look, when we tell you to do an abortion, you gotta do an abortion. When we tell you that you've gotta do transgender sex change operations on little kids, you've gotta do it. You just have to throw away your motive at your Christian values and just do what the government tells you to do. When ironically, it's the Christian values that gave birth to healthcare. That, uh, so, so anyway, it's a, it's a fascinating study. And that's one of the chapters in the book. But that's what milestone. they, they wanna do away with all of our history, William so mm -hmm. that we have nothing to go back to and say just what you said. This is our roots. They don't want that talked about. Well, and then the other irony is um, those that say, well, you know, uh, white supremacy and intersectionality and shaming and uh, all these um, different um, intersectionality, critical race theory. Well, you have to get rid of your, your race if you're from, uh, well, lo and behold, uh, they're giving us their argument in the English language. The English language is from the English. They were international white colonizers. Yeah. And so you're using their language. If you really believe, yeah. you, uh, you, you can't you get away from it. speaking that language. You should speak uh, some other different yeah. uh, language or dialect. But so I have a chapter in the book on the history of the alphabet. So uh, we take it for granted. Fascinating. But where did it come from? Egypt had 3,000 hieroglyphs, and they were complicated, and they were only for the scribes and the upper class. And matter of fact, it was the scribes' secret knowledge. They kept the hieroglyphs complicated on purpose as job security. They were needed as a class to interpret these complicated things. Common people couldn't read them. In Mesopotamia, Sumeria, they had 1,500 cuneiform characters, but only for the upper class. China had 10,000 uh, Chinese characters, but only for court records for the upper class. When Moses comes down the mountain, he does not just have the law. He has the law in a 22 character alphabet. First letters Aleph, second letter Beth, sound familiar? It's so easy to learn. Kids could learn it. All of a sudden, 
Israel is the first nation with a literate population where everybody wow. can read. Right? <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then I go into the, the history of printing. And so uh, originally writing was on papyrus. These were reeds that came from the Nile Delta. And then uh, when Islam spread in the fifth and sixth uh, hundreds, um, they cut off the trade routes and they cut off the shipments of papyrus to Europe. So there was a paper shortage in Europe. They wrote fewer books. This was the beginning of the dark ages. So Islam is largely responsible for Europe entering the dark ages. But then in the 800s, China develops paper from tree pulp. And what did they print? They were called rubbings. They would carve in a rock, put ink on it, put a piece of paper on it, and then rub on top. And, um, and so they developed Chinese currency with Chinese printing. But there's, by this time, 30,000 Chinese characters. And so you can't have a printing press with 30,000 little metal, um, you know, and so they sort of maxed out, but then you had um, Korea, South Korea developed a uh, 26 letter alphabet to be able to learn the Chinese characters. And so in the 1300s, Korea invented a metal movable type printing press, but they were the hermit kingdom. So they didn't spread it with anybody else. But then in the 1450s, you had Gutenberg develop a metal movable type printing press and it revolutionized Europe. One of the very first things he printed was what? The Bible. Bible. And the Bible became the world's best-selling book of all times. So if you were to um, have the New York Times bestseller list, the Bible would be all top 10 every single time. That's how many Bibles are sold. And um, But again, it was a, a Christian, Gutenberg, that uh, developed the printing press that revolutionized Western civilization. How in the world do you have a mind like a computer that remembers everything you just said? <laughs> it's just repetition, but, but it is a fascinating book. I could and, repeat uh, it. I could repeat it 10 years <laughs> and I would still have to read it. I'm sorry. But, but I, I mean, your, your book, you, you even talk about a Dr. Philip that he was banned for washing his hands because right. he this is uh, Dr. Philip Semmelweis. He's in Austria, Hungary, and he has a radical protocol to stop contagious diseases, right? So we have contagious diseases and we have doctors that are uh, recommending protocols that there are not the government approved ones and, and they're working, but yet the government doesn't want to let those out. And so yeah. his radical protocol was what? Washing hands between touching patients. Right? So, so he, he, found, he found out that women that were giving birth had this disease. They couldn't figure out why is that always happening? Because the same doctor with the hands that were working on a patient with a disease comes over and delivers a baby and the mother dies with the same disease. So he, right. he suggests washing hands and they- Washing hands? Yeah, they throw was, him out of the country, right? He was ridiculed that he said, well, there are these itsy bitsy tiny things you can't see and they get on your hand and they go from one patient to the other. And he was ridiculed and they chased on. He actually died in an insane asylum. And um, but what happened was it was uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. who brought hand washing to America and he was ridiculed for a while. He was the head of the Harvard Medical School. He introduced the use of a microscope and there was this uh, disease uh, called a uh, uh, Plupura, I, I can't pronounce it right, but it's postpartum. And so a, 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 this rash of women in the early to middle 1800s would die delivering babies. You'd see the tombstones. She died in childbirth. Why would, you, why would so many women die in childbirth? The doctor would do autopsies in the morning on the dead bodies. And then in the afternoon would deliver the brand new babies without changing clothes. Matter of fact, doctors, especially during the Civil War, showed how hardworking they were by how much blood was on their apron. Oh, my God. And, oh, he's a really hardworking doctor. Look at all that blood on his apron. He, they weren't washing their hands. And so this was a revolutionary medical protocol. And so Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. was a Christian. He was a strong Christian. And then you had a guy named Joseph Lister, and Listerine came from him. And he's the one that says, okay, if you use this solution, it'll kill these invisible things. But then you had Louis Pasteur, and he's the one who discovered 
uh, he's considered the father of microbiology. It's, I'm telling you, this, if it were taught in our schools today, would be absolutely amazing what would be discovered. I'll bet you 90% of the high school kids, if you did this in a high school assembly and you talked the way you've just discussed what is in this book, not a one of them would know what you're talking about. Well, and, and then there's um, even Einstein, and he uh, was, he did not, he believed in God, but he didn't believe in a personal God. Yeah. And so, uh, but nowadays, believing in any type of uh, creator is, uh, is is anathema to, to the academia. And so, uh, Sir Isaac Newton specifically said that he is not an atheist. And um, so when he uh, was invited by Edwin Hubble to go to the um, uh, observatory in California uh, to look at, and Edwin Hubble basically is the one who discovered that ours is not the only galaxy. Yeah. That some of these fuzzy stars that you could see with you know the old fashioned telescopes he looked at it closer and it wasn't a fuzzy star. It was actually another galaxy that was far away. And then he began, so this is Edwin Hubble, the telescope's named after him. So Einstein goes out there and sees what's called the red shift. So scientists thought that the universe was static. It's there, it's always been there, it'll always be there, but light travels at different speeds. And so you have the, the colors of a of a rainbow, the prism, red, yellow, blue, and green. And, and those are wavelengths and red is the slowest. And so when the, the big bang happened and these galaxies and planets are all flying away, uh, you would see what they call the red shift. So the, the objects so the further away would have a reddish gl glow to them as compared to the ones that are closer that would be more bluish. And, and this red shift uh, is evidence that the universe is expanding which means, and Einstein, after he saw this, he goes, so this means there must be a beginning, Ooh. right? And so there was the beginning of the Big Bang Theory, but this concept that, no, uh, everything did start and uh, from one point. Um, and uh, I'm not a physicist, but it's an interesting study that uh, the uh, uh, big um, uh, photon accelerators, uh, these uh, colliders, so forth, um, where they smash beams of light, and light is called photons, they smash them together at, at high speeds, and lo and behold, they've created, uh, when these particles of light crash into each other, create a uh, positron and an electron. And you know, what's the big deal with that? Well, that's considered matter. And so lo and behold, light can create matter. And so the, the Big Bang Theory is that there was this initial blast of energy of light, and then it crashed, you know, they crash into each other and so and turned into matter. Well, isn't that interesting? The Bible says, and God said, let there be light, light. right? There's a light first, and then all the creation happens. And uh, so, uh, the book has some of these uh, different topics and arguments in them, and, it, it, it and they is, all strengthened our faith. And not only that, it could be a book on Black history, because mm -hmm. throughout the book, you talk about the first Black entrepreneurs. Some of them were came from slave, and they became wealthy throughout the book. Yeah, so, so one is Benjamin Benneker. And he was a black man in Maryland, and he was a Quaker. Uh, the Quakers were the first denomination to officially be against slavery. And then the Methodists were the next. And then they began to uh, push for the abolitionist movement. So the first anti-slavery society in America was founded by Christians, uh, by the um, Quakers. And anyway, so Benjamin Benneker, a black man, he's a Quaker, and he uh, has a, a neighbor in his farm, uh, and the neighbor is a white man who studies astronomy and teaches Benjamin Benneker how to do astronomy. And, uh, and Benjamin Benneker helped uh, to survey Washington, D.C. 
So to, to make sure that all the, the lines are straight, you have to look. And so you line it up with the, the stars, which way is east, right? So you, you have to, but you'd look at the different stars on different days and everything. And so he compiles what's called an Ephraimist table. And before the days of weather broadcasters, uh, weather forecasters, um, they would look at where the planets were in years past and then the weather. And then they would be able to show through look studying the orbits where the planets will be on each day and predict what the weather would be on that day and predict the tides whether they're going to be high tide low tide or whatever and so this was used by farmers and sailors and it was called an almanac <laughs> and so benjamin benneker a black man published benneker's almanac and it became a bestseller but but anyway so here's a black man who's a scientist and his story needs to be told I mean, and that's you, what we you tell have, in the book. i marked them all i mean you have many of them in here that are just I, I never knew that many and this is like i say this is also a, a history book from for the Ameri african american uh, this this particular book uh is probably to me the most valuable i mean it's easy to read you could take this on an airplane and go through it in a fairly long flight but i mean it's absolutely like carrying an entire library with you and you have condensed it so that when you read it, you, you understand what you're reading and just, I'm t totally amazed when I read your books. Can you share just about, I think we have about a minute and a half, right? Uh, how were you born again? Uh, well, raised in a church going family, but when I was around uh, 24, my mother-in-law-to-be kept inviting me to um, Christian businessmen's groups. And I uh, was dating her daughter, who became my wife. And uh, one minute she, left. And I finally ran out of excuses. And I went to one of the groups. And I, uh, one of these businessmen's meetings, I heard somebody present the gospel. And, uh, and that's when it made sense to me. I, I remember saying that the speaker knew Jesus better than I knew Jesus. And uh, anyway, but uh, but also watching Christian television and uh, hearing people presenting the gospels. God is a just God. He's a God of rules. He's a God of laws of planetary motion, laws of physics, laws of science. He's a God of laws. He's a he's a God who yeah. has rules, yeah. and uh, that means he's a just God, uh, which means he has to judge every sin. If God does not judge every sin, his silence is giving consent to the sin. And if God gives consent to sin, he's no longer a just God. Amen. Amen. But God is a loving God and that he provided the lamb, Jesus, the son of God, to take the judgment for all of our sin. Wow. So he's a just God, but he's a loving God. So we approach God through the lamb and our, every one of our sins have been paid for. Jesus Christ is your answer. God bless you. Bye-bye.